When it comes to building furniture, I have a certain tendency to combine the clean look of white painted surfaces with some element of natural wood as a contrast. See all these examples for a reference. And when it comes to painting solid wood, I almost always go with hard maple. It's heavy and durable, and with its dense closed grain, it creates a very smooth painted surface with zero grain lines showing through. But first things first, I need to break down all these huge eight quarter boards down into rough blanks that I can pull my parts from. I bought these boards surfaced on three sides or commonly called S3S. Because I have a planer and a joiner, I typically don't spend the extra 25 cents per board foot for surfaced lumber, but as luck would have it, S3S is all my lumber dealer had in stock, so this time I get to exchange my money for all the time saved doing the initial milling work. In the end, let me tell you I was glad for this time savings because there's still plenty of work to be done on this build. Because S3S material already has a straight edge on one face, it's safe to use my miter saw to break it down. But if you have rough lumber or you don't have access to a miter saw, this can also be done with a jigsaw. Just watch your toes. All right, with all these blanks cut, I can rip them down further at the table saw so that I end up with parts that are slightly oversized from their final dimensions. I typically like to leave an extra two inches in length and about a quarter of an inch in width. I'll show you why that's important in a few minutes, but first I need to glue all these up into larger blanks. Yes, I did just cut them up, and yes, now I'm gluing them back together, but in a different direction. Welcome to woodworking. These blanks are going to form the various parts that I'm going to use to build the trestle style legs of the table and two bench seats. Yes, I said bench seats. If after watching this video you find that building a table takes a while, then you're going to know exactly why I skipped building a set of six chairs and instead opted to build two more tiny tables. A quick time saving tip here is to glue up multiple parts using one set of clamps. You just have to remember to only glue the joints that you want to glue and not create one huge mega leg. I'm cleaning the glue off now because it's late and I want to go to bed. Normally I'd let this glue set up for an hour or so and then scrape it off, which is much cleaner, but tonight my bed is calling. And thanks to the magic of editing, it's the next day, so let's see what I've got. To clean up these blanks, I like to take them a couple of times across the joiner to clean up those glue joints and make them nice and flat. And then through the planer to get the other sides. This is why I cut my blanks slightly bigger than I needed them to be. I can just work these down a little bit at a time until I get to my final dimensions. Then I can trim these to final length with the miter saw, which is always so satisfying to me. Now with my blanks all sized properly, I need to shape them based on my design for the trestle base, which means that I need to cut these angles at the top and bottom, as well as these sweeping curves in the middle. Getting those angled cuts is going to be stupid easy because I've got a secret weapon. If you don't know what an L fence is or what it's used for, just watch this sequence and soon you'll be making one for yourself. With my L fence positioned just flush with the top and outside face of the saw blade like this, I place some two-sided tape on my leg parts and then attach a straight edge guide made from either MDF or plywood or hardwood scraps. Any of those are going to work just as long as it has a straight edge on it. Now with the saw on, run the straight edge along the L fence like this and everything that passes under the L fence gets cut off cleanly and safely. Here's that process one more time. See those reference lines? That's the start and end point of the taper that I'm trying to cut. I line the guide up along those two points like this. Then I zip that through the saw, making sure to push the guide along the fence and let it pull the workpiece through the cut. That's going to prevent any deflection that might happen if you press the workpiece into the spinning blade. And just like that, I've got my taper. All right, pause. You may now be understandably mind blown and contemplating making one of these immediately. And I have your back because I have plans for this whole fence that you see here, including the L fence and a few other accessories. I'll leave a link in the description below if you want to check that out. Okay, now I need to make those pesky curves and to do that, I'm going to rely on robot technology. Uh, I'm going to make a template. This is one of my favorite uses for a CNC, but I totally understand if you don't have the room in your shop or your budget for a CNC, and the good news is there's another way. You can print your template onto a sheet of paper and glue that to your part and then cut close to that line by about an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch, whatever your skill or comfort level allows for. Then instead of using a router to cut flush to the template like I'm doing here, you'll need to use a spindle sander to slowly sand back to the lines on the template. 
But unlike a sander, the router creates a fluffy pile of shavings that you can then push into your dust collector like this. This is so much more fun than sanding. Okay, that's enough fooling around. For joinery on this project, I'm using dominoes. By the way, if you watch a lot of YouTube woodworking, this is normally the part of the video where the person is going to say something like, you can also use dowels or pocket screws, blah, blah, blah. But for this kind of project, I'm going to go ahead and say, don't do that. When it comes to making nice furniture projects, I see that you have one of two possible options here. You can go the long and tedious route, making all your parts extra long and cut your own traditional mortise and tenons. Very respectable, and if you have that kind of time, God bless you. Or you can finally bite the bullet and get a domino and do this the really easy way. Now, I'm not going to try to convince you with logic and reasoning why one way or the other is better because both ways are perfect for this kind of project. Nope, instead I'm going to apply the time-honored advertising tactic of peer pressure. Come on. You know you want a domino. See how much fun I'm having? Just get one. Everyone's doing it. You don't want to be left out, do you? Okay, okay, but seriously, while I was busy messing with you just then, I screwed up. Man, that karma came back around quick. I forgot that I needed to cut slots for attaching the base to the top. But no worries, there's a fix. I just used two-sided tape to attach the tapered offcuts from the L-fence, and now I'm back to a perpendicular reference surface that I can use to plunge all the way through with my domino. After I plunge all the way through, I'm going to just adjust to a shallower depth of cut and also throw a bigger cutter on the domino. Then I can plunge in the same locations again. This creates these nifty little slots that can accept a bolt, and the slot's going to allow for the tabletop to expand and contract with seasonal wood movement. The last bit of cutting that I need to do here is just to add a slight round over to all these parts, just enough to break the edges so they aren't sharp to the touch. Then I can do a quick dry fit of everything just to make sure I didn't screw up and make any huge mistakes. And after masking off all the mortises, these parts are ready for a paint job, which I won't be boring you with in this video. So you know I did a whole video on my spray finish process and no one watched it. Seriously, it's kind of embarrassing. It's one of the worst performing videos on my channel. Apparently no one's interested and so if you're not interested, I'm not going to keep putting myself out there trying to teach you something that you don't want to learn. Wait, now you do want to watch it? Well guess what pal, I don't need your pity views. I'm doing just fine without it. But um, you know, if you did want to watch it. I'm not saying you have to, but hypothetically speaking, if you wanted to, maybe I'll leave a link in the description below. Hypothetically speaking. Alrighty, well, I'm going to pretend like that didn't just happen. Let's wipe the slate clean and move on to the next phase of this project, which is the tabletop. For this part of the project, I'm going to go a little bit outside of my comfort zone and do something that I've never done before, which is work with reclaimed material. My friend Matt Hobbs tears down old barns so that he can sell the lumber to you and me and he hooked me up with this really amazing heart pine that came from a barn that was built in the late 1800s. They really don't make 2x8s like this anymore. So to get some practice working with this material, I'm going to start small and work on one of the bench tops first before tackling the full tabletop. In fact, the bench top is just going to be made out of these two boards. The first thing I need to do is rip one edge of each board straight, and the best way to do that is with my track saw. Well, it would be the best way if the foam insulation would stop moving. And right off the saw, I was getting a pretty decent glue joint, but it's not perfect and a little gappy. No worries, I can fix this right up. See, if I take these two boards and fold them up like a book with the two jointed edges facing down, I can give them a quick pass across the joiner together. Most times, this is only going to take one pass. By doing this, no matter what angle your joiner fence is set at, the resulting glue joint is going to be seamlessly matched up. I'm pretty sure geometry can explain exactly how this is possible, but I prefer to think of it as voodoo magic and move on. These two boards glue up perfectly now, and I can tell that because without much clamping pressure at all, I get a nice even bead of glue squeeze out all the way down the length of the joint. To create the tabletop, I need to examine each board and arrange them in a way that I think looks best. I'm not worried here about grain direction at all. I only care that I get the best looking top that I can. These boards all have so much character in them. There's sawmill marks, old nail holes. Oh, and look, here's where a raccoon gave birth. Ew, sorry. That joke even grossed me out. Once I have all the boards arranged the way I want them, I go ahead and mark them sequentially on the underside. Eventually, when I go to glue these up, this is going to be the side facing up in the clamps. More on why I chose to do it that way in a few minutes. 
I'm repeating the same process here that I went through with the bench top where I need to rip off some edges to create glue joints. This one board has a good bit of cupping and surface checking in it, which I think is due to the fact that the pith is running right through the center of the board. And so I'm just going to go ahead and cut that in half of the table saw to remove some of that. Oh, I also need to mention that if you're working with any kind of reclaim lumber, you need to pick up a metal detector. This wand is rated pretty well and it's only about 40 bucks. That's well worth the price, especially if you have expensive saw blades or a saw stop table saw. If you hit metal and trigger that break on the saw, that's 120 bucks to replace right there, assuming you don't also damage the saw blade. These detectors are really easy to use, just run the wand along all surfaces of the board and you'll find out fast enough if there's a nail that needs to be removed. But I have to say, Matt's crew does a really good job of processing their reclaimed lumber, and I only had a couple of these hidden gems in all the lumber that I bought for this project. And now that my board is metal free, I can get back to work and cut this up. At this point, everything is pretty much ready to glue up now, except that this one board is a good bit thicker than the other ones, and I don't really want to deal with this after it's glued up because this thing is way too big to go through the planer or drum sander. No problem though, I can just run the bottom side across the joiner a few times to cut down on the thickness. I don't really care that this board is so much lighter than the others because this is the underside of the table, and nobody but my 8 year old is ever going to see this once the table is built. Now all I need to do is glue it up. I'm not using dominoes or biscuits for alignment here, just glue. Trying to align all these unmilled boards that aren't completely jointed in thickness the same way is going to be a nightmare if not impossible. The best thing to do, I think, is to glue this whole thing up with the top of the table facing down in the clamps. That way at least the top surface will be relatively aligned and I'll preserve as much of that character as I possibly can. And since I don't care about the looks of the bottom, I have an idea of what to do to flatten that up. Once the glue is all dried, I remove the clamps and turn to my belt sander to do a thorough job of evening out all these joints as best I can. 60 grit sandpaper makes this job go by fairly quickly, maybe 45 minutes of work, I just have to remember to keep that sander moving at all times. If I were to hesitate over one spot for too long, this thing can really remove a lot of material quickly and I can create a big old trench in the surface. By the way, if you like this video, I sure would appreciate a like and subscribe to the channel. That way you don't miss new videos in the future. And all my subscribers know that when I hit big subscriber milestones, I make a brand new shop tour video, so let that be your incentive. And once again, I turn to my trusty track saw to trim the ends of the table flush. I'm going to be adding breadboard ends to the top, so I can't really make this cut with a jigsaw. I want these edges to be nice and crisp and clean, so track saw it is. Now I can flip this baby over and get a look at the top of the table. All things considered, this is reasonably flat. I wasn't expecting perfect because these are all unmilled boards from two centuries ago. I'm just happy that I'm not going to have to get too creative with my sanding to make it work. So normally I wouldn't waste your time by filming the sanding, but this is a unique situation that I think you'd appreciate seeing. If I speed this way up, you can see what it looks like to remove the outer patina and reveal all the saw marks and unique underlying character in these boards. It's kind of cool to go back and watch this process on film when in the moment you're so nervous about over sanding and ruining the entire look of this table. So I really think this table would look great with breadboard ends and once again I'm going to turn to the domino to get that done. But there is a specific process that has to be followed in order to do this correctly and account for wood movement. So to get started, I'm going to mark some reference lines where I want my dominoes to go. I just made five of these reference lines across both the table and breadboard, which I'll then use as markers for creating the mortises. To start, I plunge my five mortises on the table side. All of these are cut using the tight setting on the domino. That just means that there's no slot from side to side and the dominoes are going to fit snugly in the mortises. Then I do the same thing on the breadboard side, but only for the middle mortise. For the other four, I'm going to swap over to the loose setting on the domino, which is going to cut a wider mortise. This is going to be key for allowing for wood movement. Now I'm going to dry fit the whole thing together and flip this over to the underside of the table. I have the breadboards clamped pretty tight to the table here, and this will allow me to drill pilot holes into the breadboard and through the dominoes inside. I'm using a tape flag here as a depth stop so that I don't accidentally drill all the way through the tabletop. These holes are going to be used to hold dowels that are going to pin the breadboard to the end of the table. Normally this could be done on the top side of the table as an accent, but I'm using maple dowels and I really thought that this would be an eyesore and not really go with the overall look that I wanted for the top. Okay, here's another critical step. 
For all the dominoes except the middle one, I need to widen the pilot hole from side to side. And now I can glue all the dominoes into place on the table side. If you remember, this is the side with the tight-fitting mortises. But on the breadboard side, I'm only adding glue to the middle mortise. The other four loose mortises can't have any glue in there for this to work properly. Everything goes back together now, and I'm going to clamp this back up to that tight position, which should align the dowel holes back up with the dominoes inside. And now I can just add my dowels with a slight taper on one end to help them fit into those dominoes. And just add a dab of glue before I knock them in, and that glue is just there to hold the domino to the breadboard and doesn't affect the inner workings of the dominoes. All right, now I just trim those dominoes almost flush and then hit them with a sander to flush them up completely. The last thing I need to do here is trim the breadboards. I like leaving mine slightly proud, maybe by about a 32nd of an inch. And now I can finally add some finish to see how this comes alive, and man, I was surprised. The color change was really dramatic. I knew that this pine had some red undertones in it, but this was really a deep, rich red, almost too red for my liking. The finish I'm using is Waterlox Urethane, and I ended up mixing in some of this Watco Danish oil in Dark Walnut. This toned down the red and added some more brown, which I think ended up looking pretty nice. Okay, with all the parts finished now, it's time to bring this project home and assemble everything together, starting with the benches. First thing I'm going to do is expose these mortises by removing this tape. And these dominoes are going to run through the center of the stretcher with plenty of wiggle room like this. Oh wait, I haven't talked about the stretchers. So basically I plunge two mortises through each end like this. Then I cut these shallow notches out where the vertical portion of the legs are going to go, like this. I glue in some dominoes to one side and slide them into the stretcher. Add the other side and then clamp it up to dry. While that's happening, I can add more dominoes to the ends and add the top and bottom supports. I am relieved to see that all my planning paid off and these parts are all fitting together nicely. Then I repeated that exact same process with the table base. I'm really liking how the stretchers appear to wrap around the legs and I'm glad that I added that design element. Every once in a while I get a decision right. This assembly process is when having a domino feels like it pays for itself in productivity. A little planning and layout up front leads to just being able to bang everything together at the end. Assembling this entire base took all of 15 minutes in real time. I don't think using a domino makes me a better woodworker, but it definitely makes things more accessible to me because it allows me to add more complicated builds into my already busy life and get them done in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, the last task is to attach the base to the top. I'm keeping this process simple by lining up my base where I want it and marking out where those bolt slots are located. Then I mark the center of those slots with my center punch, which is a super handy tool for drilling holes accurately. The point of the drill bit centers right into that divot so you drill exactly where you meant to without your drill bit wandering on you. Again, I'm using a tape flag here so that I don't accidentally drill through the top. Now in the hole goes a long threaded insert. By the way, you can add some epoxy to the hole first if you want it for extra strength. I didn't do that for the benches because they're really not that heavy, but I did do it for the tabletop. I attached everything together with these flange head bolts which grab onto the shoulders that I created inside those bolt slots earlier and just like that one bench is complete and holy cow does it look amazing. The table attaches the same way, just remember to get a lifting buddy and tag team the top. If I had to guess I'd say this tabletop weighs around 100 pounds. I just have to get those inserts lined up with the slots and I was able to use my patented neck move to get the job done. Don't try this at home, kids. I'm super pleased with how this table turned out, but it really was quite time consuming, and if this turns out to be the only table I ever make, I'm glad I did it and that my family gets together around it for years to come.